This tutorial will walk through the 3D projection mapping capabilities of QLab 4. We will look inside the video surface editor and talk about the difference between surfaces and screens. We will also experiment with features like warping, masks, splits and constraints, as well as setting up multiple projectors as screens. QLab is an application designed to playback media using cues. It's used a lot in theatre and elsewhere for controlling sound, video and lighting. QLab also has the tools to output visual media to screens, video walls, a single projector or multi-projector blends via the video surface editor, which will be the focus of this tutorial. Note that a lot of the features I'll be demonstrating require a pro video or pro bundle license for QLab. Now let's open up the video surface editor by hitting the gear icon in the bottom right and choosing video from the menu on the left. I already have two surfaces created for me by default, which correspond to the two displays I have connected to my MacBook Pro. Surface 1 is my laptop screen. Surface 2 is my full HD projector. I want to output from my projector, so let's dive into Surface 2 by hitting Edit. As I said, QLab created this surface automatically when it detected that I had a projector connected. I can see my projector over here in the list of screens. My projector is 1920 by 1080, so my default surface, to which the projector is automatically assigned, is also 1920 by 1080 in its dimensions. Notice that QLab is calling the projector a screen. A screen is what we call any video output. This might be a device like a projector, a monitor, or an LED screen, or it might be another output like Siphon. If the projector is a screen, then why does QLab make us deal with this extra concept of a surface? Aren't they the same thing? Well, no. Even though with our current situation, the surface is 1920 by 1080 and our screen is 1920 by 1080, our surface can be any size we want it to be. A surface is an abstract concept that we can think of as being like a virtual canvas that might have one or more than one screen assigned to it. That still sounds pretty jargony. Imagine you have a large wall that needs three projectors to cover the whole thing with video. The whole wall is your surface, your canvas, and to that surface you assign your three projectors, your screens. Inside the video surface editor, you can arrange the three projector screens so that each takes care of a third of the video wall. I'm going to keep things simple and projection map this white square. This white square is my surface, so I can change the dimensions to reflect this, for example, 1080 by 1080, and I'll rename it white square to be clear. Our projector was already assigned as a screen when this surface was created, but just for fun, let's delete the projector and reassign it as if we had created this surface from scratch. Here are the screens available to me. Color LCD is my laptop screen. Partial screens is for if we were using a display splitter like a dual head to go. Siphon is an output that makes it possible for applications to share video. So it allows us to output video from QLab into another piece of software. Notice how the blue area shows the resolution of the projector screen, laid over my smaller square surface. We have some screen controls down here. They enable us to change the origin of our projector if we wanted to, or to rotate it if that makes sense for the shape of our surface. Toggling on rear flips the output horizontally if you are rear projecting onto a screen or gauze, for example. If edge blending is enabled, it means that QLab will make intelligent decisions about when to blend the edges of screens or treat screens as being double stacked when they overlap one another. If I turn on grid, show all, my projector will output a white grid, which can be very helpful. You can also output a guide. Over here on the right, in the surface controls, I have the option to warp the surface. This will enable me to map my content onto the face of my white square in physical space. With perspective selected from the drop-down, I can pull the control points around and match them onto the corners of my white square. The process lets me compensate for the way my projector produces a skewed image on the white square because it's projecting at an angle rather than perfectly straight on. This process is sometimes referred to as keystoning or corner pinning. 
On the drop-down, we also have other warp types, for example linear, which is good for complex shapes, but does not introduce perspective correction, and bezier, which is good for mapping to curved surfaces. For example, if I were mapping to a curved screen or a cylinder, I would use bezier. Also in the surface controls over here on the right, I can bring in a mask image. For maximum efficiency, a mask image should be grayscale, i.e. contain only black, white or grey pixels, and the image should be the same size as the surface, although QLab will resize an image and convert it to grayscale if necessary. Black pixels block content, while white pixels let content show through. So this mask, for example, will soften the edges of my surface. I can also mask with a custom shape. This is fairly useful, but it's not an ideal process. Imagine my white square was a wall, and there was a doorway through the wall that I wanted to mask out so that no content is projected on the door. I've represented the door with a green piece of card in front of my white square. How would you go about doing that if you don't know the exact dimensions of the doorway and how it sits within the wall without doing a lot of measuring? It would be ideal to have an integrated mask editor so that you can interactively edit the mask in the video surface editor. Until that feature comes, there is a workaround. I can load an image as a mask and then open that image in a graphics editing application like Photoshop or GIMP. I'll roughly approximate where I think the door is with a rectangular selection and fill it with black pixels. Now I'll save over the original file. Because QLab is continuously looking at that file for changes, the mask will update fairly swiftly in my output. I can see that I've done a fairly good job of getting the black pixels in the right place, but I could afford to refine them a little more, so I'll move and scale them, save over the file again, and see how the changes look. So with a few iterative tweaks and saves, I can get a fairly accurate result. We can also add constraints to bring in the sides of the surface to make it smaller. Why would we use constraints and not create a new smaller surface? Of course you could, but take the example of projection mapping a building. Imagine my white square is the front of a building and I took a lot of care to warp it perfectly so it matches the facade. If I want to use four projectors to each map a quadrant of the building, I would have to do all the corner pinning again for each new surface. With constraints, I would duplicate the surface that represents the whole building facade four times and adjust the constraints for each quadrant, leaving all my original corner pinning in place. I've introduced another white box to represent the corner of a building or a bit of theatre set to better show how we can use splits to help us. I'll change my surface width to reflect my set which is now wider. If I add a horizontal split at x is 0, my screen is split in half and I can use these new control points to map the corner. Hopefully you can see how by adding more splits, you could map more and more complex shapes. If you want to delete the split, select it and hit the X next to the selected split. We've been working with just the guides up until this point to get visual feedback from our projector. Let's put some video content onto our surface. I'm going to come out of the video surface editor. I want to set up a queue sequence of two video files that will play each video in turn and then loop back to the beginning. I can either drag the video files into the workspace or I can create a new video queue by clicking this little film icon. Then down here in the basics tab of the inspector, I can specify the target of the queue by either double clicking on the yellow text 
and navigating to the file or dragging in the video file here. I will set both these cues to auto follow so the next cue will be triggered as soon as the first cue completes. I can either do this in this column of the workspace or I can highlight my cues and change their continue behavior to auto follow in the basics tab. I'll make the cue sequence loop by creating a start cue and specifying Q1 as its target. If I highlight both my video cues and go into the Display and Geometry tab, in here I'm going to set their video surface to white square. Now if I trigger my first cue, I can see it on my boxes. Up to this point I've been using one projector. I'm now going to connect another full HD projector. I'm going to add my second projector as another screen assigned to this surface. I'll make sure the guide is turned on for both and then corner pin them to the two square surfaces inside the little corner I've created with my white cardboard boxes. I'll turn off my guides and trigger some video. That looks good. I'm seeing two duplicates of the same content because the projector screens are using the same surface. This may or may not be what you want. What should I do if I want to have a different video play on each side? In that case, I'd create a new surface with display and assign it one of the projectors. I'd give the surface an appropriate name and dimensions and then corner pin it to the physical surface of my white box. Now I can assign one video to the right side and one video to the left side. But how to trigger them together? The first cue is currently set to auto follow. This means it has a post wait time that is the same as the duration of the clip. All this means is that the cue will wait until it completes before triggering the next one. I'll change this to auto continue. This means that the cue will trigger and the next cue will trigger immediately afterwards, assuming its post wait time is set to zero, which it is by default. If I trigger my first cue by hitting go or spacebar, we can see that this works. This video has hopefully given you a better understanding of the video editor inside QLab. If you're interested in learning more, in another tutorial I'll be applying the principles covered here to the project of projection mapping a five-tier wedding cake. This will pose more of a challenge because there are 10 surfaces that require unique content. If you like the video content I've been using, you might want to take a look at my shop, where I sell animations, loops and templates for cake mapping and projection mapping. If you have any questions, drop them in the comments below. If this video helped you, please hit that like button. Subscribe and hit the bell so you don't miss out on future projection mapping tutorials and videos.